Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, couldn't be happier um, to, uh, than to be here today. Um, I think we're um, one of the themes that David already already um, gave us a, a bit of an introduction to is is um, is is a journey. And I'd like to kind of start by saying that I th I think uh, Perani, this is maybe the fourth year we've done this. Okay. So we've been on, we together, through Cities of the Future, which is an IWA program, our, our work with CWE, we've been on a journey. And we've been on a journey that started off um, with, you know, the classic issue, why do we need to make changes? What, you know, why can't the City of the Future be just like the City of the Past? And then we've been working bit by bit into doing it you know, figuring it out and doing it. So we're at, at, a, at a doing it stage, and I'm really happy to be the, the key introducer here because I think you're going to see from the different people who are going to talk, they are ha making this happen, and they're doing it in developed and developing countries in different ways. Um, and, and when you put it together, it's pretty impressive. I want to work off of a, of, a, of a graph or a picture that I, I hope some of you have seen before. It turns out it's a very powerful picture. I've, I've been in, in Cities of the Future discussions all over the world and for a number of years, as David said. This is, was done by a woman by the name of Rebecca Brown. It's a simplification, um, but nonetheless, if you look at this, you can see an evolution that most of the industrialized countries and some of the central cities in the, in the developed countries have gone through. And, it, and, it, and when you look at it, it's actually pretty, pretty faithful to what most people did. They worked on water supply, they added sewers, then they worked on drainage, and, um, and then started working on, on, on the, treating the receiving waters, working then into where the state of the art is now in the last two areas, a water cycle city, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Melbourne and Singapore as examples of these water sensitive cities. So we're going to use this as a framework, but I, I, I see the, the kind of evolution that this implies it is the evolution of cities, since cities are always evolving, and this program is evolving alongside of it. Now, um, we, I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on why we're doing this, because many of you are, have already got that idea. I mean, we can no longer live in, in, a, in, a, in a set of circumstances that we're facing in, in the 21st century as though we were in a different time, right? With half the population and, and a lot lower expectations for the planet and for income. I mean, we can just go down the list. So we're, we're in a different world and to meet that world, and we're building, by the way, one of David's uh, favorite expressions is the future is now. If you think about water, you're, when you build something as a water engineer or designer, right? The future truly is now because you're building for 30 to 50 years ahead because that's how long that asset's going to live, whether you like it or not. So, um, but what, what a central concept in, in addition to the evolution that you see in water systems in the traditional systems, which are the, as David said, the legacy systems, is the notion that in the developed world, which is largely built, right? The developed world is largely built. You can, and you can see it in this graph, it's that brown, it's about a billion people. And some countries are expanding, some countries are shrinking, but it's about a billion people. The, the, the under construction part of the world is that big green wedge. And this just takes you to 2030. It gets bigger and bigger. So we, when we think about cities of the future and these ideas, we're actually having to partition our thinking a little bit because in some ways it's a little different application, but in general it, it is for the same problem. So let's start off with the, the big problem, which is we got a lot of people on this planet and we got a lot more coming. We've got uh, those people are coming into the world at a rate of about a million a week. And 90% of them, 90% of those people are going to be in developing world countries and 90% of those are going to be in urban areas. So we're building a city of about 800,000 a week. Uh, Michael has some wonderful slides to uh, the next speaker to, to, to show you, to illustrate this. As I said, we're, we're, we're going to be doing this not just for a year, but for about 
40 more years before the population grows up enough to, that it levels off. And the bad news, I think the bad news, is that most of that growth is going to be in smaller cities, not in big cities. So the management challenges are, are huge. So let's go back to then our picture here from Rebecca. And let's talk about the cities of the future, where we've been and where, we, where we're going. As I said, we spent the first couple of years in cities of the future kind of laying out the, the, the case for change, right? The, and you always have to do that. And then start to lay out a vision for what cities of the future could look like. And what we've now done is essentially move to the next phase where we're actually implementing these concepts. And I would su submit to you that, um, that the ideas are pretty, pretty much now accepted. And, and it's really a question of how we do this. So in developing countries, you've seen, which tend to be in, in the range on the right here with a red circle around it, they're, lar they're largely built from a, as, as David would say, we're, we're kind of moving into advanced concepts because most of the basics are taken care of and those cities uh, are working in stable populations, right? So the, 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 the discussion really is about how to move more into a water cycle city, as it's called here. So we're talking about adding the ability to reuse water, to recover nutrients. And then there's a group of, of cities, two of which I want to talk about, which are um, Melbourne and Singapore, that, that leapfrogged, actually, and went right to this water-sensitive uh, city concept. And in a nutshell, that, that concept says, we've, we've finished the plumbing. We're really working on the, on the, on the aesthetics and the livability. So the, that word livability is a big term by, by, for, for communities that are really focused on this concept. They're not, only, they're not only making functional cities that are well engineered, right, and that are efficient, but they're making cities that are livable from, from the water aesthetics point of view. A good, a good example of this is Melbourne. Melbourne is in the midst of a pretty big transition. You can just see from this one picture the kind of thinking and planning that's going on at the city level, right? So, so from a water engineers and a, and a utility point of view, we're, you're not just thinking anymore about, about uh, plumbing the city. You're thinking about making the city a, a water-focused, water-friendly city for all citizens. And you're working with planners. You're dealing with, with also with, with, with energy and, and heating. And, and the parks um, that, that go with them and, and weaving in, uh, you know, very good water functionality into these parks. Another example <coughs> is Singapore. This is, a, uh, this is called Pongol, which is it's an old fishing village, just developed. This is what it looks like today. It just won a big award. But interestingly, just to sort of illustrate these concepts, you can see off to the right this reservoir. You can see off to the left the Pongol Reservoir. This area is being newly built, and instead of building a pipe from one reservoir to the other, you can see they built a waterway and, and engineered into this development fantastic aesthetics, but also it's part of their whole drainage and treatment system. So they're building, with building aesthetics into, into that city. Now, when we, let's change gears because we go from Singapore and Melbourne to Masindi, I thank Michael Jacobson for this picture. This is a town in northern Uganda that's growing. I think it's doubling at some fantastic rate. But it's a, it's a, one, it's a good example of one of the smaller cities that, that exists um, that constitute cities that have a future for sure, right? So what is that future going to look like? And how, how can we get the, the, get the cities of the future concepts and make this city something that, that is an enviable city in 20 or 30 years as opposed to just a, just a wasteland of poor planning and, and, and underdevelopment in terms of the, of the water and, and um, drainage and wastewater services. Typically in developing countries, you'll see a, a, you know, a, a vast, a big, some of the bigger cities with a vast uh, unserved area and then, a, and then a core. So as we were talking about, Michael and I were talking about before, sometimes if you're, say, in a place like Nairobi, you'll see a sort of a more Singapore-like possibility in the center city juxtaposed to Masindi 
or worse, you know, which is essentially no roads and no services. So the, the, the developed, developing country case is a complicated one, but what's really nice about this session is we've got two or three great presentations that'll help you see what the possibilities are. I come back to Rebecca's diagram and observe that, you know, in an unconstructed world, right? In the, in, and, and just to give you an idea, in Asia, only according to the Asian Development Bank, if you look at, at, at where Asia will be in 2050, less than 30% of Asia is built. That's the staggering number if you think about it, right? So we, in these situations, we do not have to go through the Victorian evolution of adding water, then putting sewerage in or whatever kinds of um, uh, sanitation and then figuring out drainage after that and then having to go through this sort of whole long process. And, uh, you know, I would submit to you that, that the, 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 the version of Rebecca's diagram for the, um, for the future in the developing countries is actually to consolidate and, and make smarter the systems that we build. And we would do that compelled by money because we can do it a lot cheaper than traditional, uh, particularly staged construction like this. Um, we can do it, we would do it for resource recovery reasons and we can incrementalize investments and, and Michael and others will talk about that. But this is a compelling challenge, I think, uh, for the developing countries. And then, and I would suggest, and I don't mean to sound pejorative, but, you know, the, the cities, towns in these countries don't have enough money to be able to finance at one crack the kind of sophistication and, that we all want to get to, right? Like Melbourne, like, like uh, you know, uh, Singapore, where you're really thinking about the aesthetics and the parks and all the things that ha should go with cities. So I would suggest that what we should think about is how to get the engineering right, that's on the left, and then create uh, right-of-ways and, and, and opportunities to grow into that vision you know, as resources permit. So we're um, finishing up here. So um, we're really in this process now of moving to the right in the developing world and in, and in mature and uh, legacy systems. And I hope to, the, to in the developing country, to, to be able to really think differently about those first four or five steps. And, and Neil, for example, is coming here from Durban, and he can talk to this issue. But now then, then the, the final thing I'd like to leave you with is, well, what's to the right of this? And I was just in a session this morning uh, on a panel talking about Nexes, right? And, and, and what I would suggest is next is really thinking about the city in the context of the bigger picture and how do we optimize the, the resource usage, right? Not just in the city, but between agriculture, the city, energy, the city. And cities have a lot of resources to, to, to contribute, if you like, because of reuse in particular to, to these other sectors. And if we optimize in the way we've been talking about our cities of the future internally in the city, and then we've, and we do that with a mind towards what we're doing in the bigger picture, we will be very much better off resource-wise on a crowded planet. Finally, um, uh, because this is about food, this uh, and food and nexes, I want to just put a slide up from David, um, who's, who is in, in a developed country, the United States, thinking about how we weave in, not only work with agriculture, but weave in some of these other sectors. Um, you talk about fish farming, for example, in ur urban um, aquaponics, and uh, aquaponics, excuse me, and then urban agriculture. And there's great controversies about whether this is possible, but I think it's definitely got to be on a radar screen as something where, if we're thinking about cities of the future, we have to be thinking about these extensions. So with that, I'm finished. I'm very happy that you're here, and I'm hoping that you're going to enjoy a really great set of presentations. And we have a really, I mean, I've, like, like David said, I've been working on this for about five, seven years, something like that. And this is really where the world is moving. And if we get on top of this, we can make our cities productive, better places to live, very efficient, right? And we can work in a, a much more livable component. Thank you very much.